Hi. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Gravestock, and I'm a senior international programmer at TIP, and it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this screening of Joel Bakken and Jennifer Abbott's The New Corporation, the unfortunate, unfortunately necessary sequel, which had its world premiere here a couple days ago. Uh, as you join us today, we encourage you to reflect on the land that you are on, who the traditional keepers of the land are, what the treaty relationship is, or if it's unceded territory. We are located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. The territory is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We are extremely grateful to work on this land. As part of Share Her Journey, Tiff's commitment to supporting women behind and in front of the camera, we're thrilled to spotlight the incredible films uh, by women this year's at this year's festival, including Jennifer Abbott, who was one of the directors on this afternoon's film, uh, or this morning's film. Uh, a sincere thank you to our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and to our major supporters, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto for their continued support. This film plays as part of TIFF Docs, which is generously sponsored by A&E Indie Films. Thank you to our members and donors. You help us create a more informed and enga engaged and connected world. For more details about membership and donations, visit tiff.net slash join. I want to remind you guys, this film is eligible for the People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. Uh, this film is also eligible for the Amplify Voices Award presented by Canada Goose. We'd like to thank Grant Street Productions for providing us with the movie, and a big, big thanks to Trish Dolman as well for uh, getting the movie here. Uh, the film you'll be seeing, I think, is one of the most essential and urgent films at this year's festival. It's a sequel to one of the most revered and widely celebrated Canadian documentaries ever made, 2003's The Corporation, which responded to legal definitions of the corporation as a person with the... With, with accompanying the same accompanying rights by asking what kind of person would a corporation be? And the answer was a psychopath. Uh, of course. This film explores corporations' recent charm initiative where corporations try to convince us that they're caring and responsible elements of society who aren't just interested in making money while well, making enormous amounts of money and fight, fighting regulations which protect people from them. It takes this analysis right up to our current moment. It is perhaps the timeliest film at this year's festival. Please join me in welcoming director Joel Backen. Thank you very much. Um, normally as a filmmaker, when you see an audience like this, it kind of worries you, but I've been assured this, that the house is sold out. So strange times. Um, Typically, I don't like to say too much before a screening because, needless to say, the screening should speak for itself, and I don't want to shape your perception of it. Uh, but this is a good opportunity to express gratitude to people um, who I worked with and who helped make the film and to the festival for inviting us here, uh, for being really creative and thoughtful and figuring out how to put on an event of, of the size and scope in these challenging times. I really think uh, TIFF has set a, a model for doing this, uh, and I'm really grateful to them. Um, I also want to thank uh, my co-director, Jennifer Abbott, who unfortunately couldn't make it, um, and our absolutely brilliant editor, Peter Rowick, our sound and music maestros, Velcro Ripper and Matt Roberts, and our incredible narrator, Charles Officer, a filmmaker in his own right who um, just premiered his own film, uh, Achilles Escape, a couple days ago. So, uh, so it's really, really exciting uh, to have worked with these people and wonderful to have worked with them. Uh, and of course, my family, my wife, Rebecca Jenkins, who is here today, uh, and who not only provided love and support, but was also a production assistant on some of the shoots, uh, lugging equipment through the streets of Barcelona, uh, doing makeup at a shoot in New York, and so uh, really grateful to her, and, and providing great notes on cuts as this film evolved. Um, our son, Mayim, who was at the previous screening, but not this one, Mayim Back and Klein, uh, 
uh, who was a researcher on the project and also did some shooting, including that beautiful image of a brick wall with graffiti on it that has been um, part of the sort of publicity materials for this. Um, and of course, our daughter, Sadie Jenkins Wade, who just provided love, support, encouragement throughout the arduous process, uh, many years of making this film. But of course, we make films and write books and do these things so people will look at them and read them. And, and so I really have to express my gratitude to, I was going to say all of you, but there aren't that many. So to those of you who came today, um, I'm, I'm really grateful that you came to see this film. I, I really hope that it moves you. I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you enjoy watching it. So thank you so much. And I'll see you on the other side for some Q&A. Uh, enjoy the show. Once again, please welcome Joel Backen. Hi. Uh, before we get started, I just, uh, I meant to before, I just want to thank Steve Gravestock. He's been amazing in uh, many, many different ways. Um, and also, I neglected to thank uh, our wonderful producers, Betsy Carson and Trish Dolman. So I just wanted to uh, give a shout out for them. Does anybody want to start? Questions? Comments? Manifestos, angry screeds, anyone? Or I can start. Uh, do you want to maybe? Uh, do you want to talk about how? I mean, it's been uh, I think 17 years since uh, 2003 when the corporation was released. Uh, what led you back to this subject, and uh, how long did it take to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for this one to gel? Yeah, I, I first had the idea of doing a follow-up or a sequel, both for the book and the film, when I was sitting in a theater like this uh, at the 10th anniversary screening of the first film, of The Corporation. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, we, we made that film to kind of contain or even slay uh, the dragon of corporate capitalism. And here it is bigger than ever, more powerful than ever, uh, you know, breathing fire more dangerously than ever. And, and, and also saying, hey, I'm not a dragon anymore. I'm your friend. And I thought, that's really kind of a problem that obviously our first film didn't do the trick. Um, the, all the things that we talked about, climate change, decaying democracy, inequality, um, had gotten worse. Corporations had gotten more powerful. And now they were even saying to us and to others, hey, we're not psychopaths anymore. You know, we're, we're good now. We got the message. We heard it. We've upped our game, we've bettered ourselves, we've reformed ourselves, and now we're okay. So I thought this is actually uh, something that needs to be looked at, and, and nothing after 2013 convinced me otherwise. So uh, I got to work on it, and um, Jennifer joined in 2017, and that's sort of when we really went into production. The four years before that, I was researching and writing treatments and trying to get funding and all of that. And uh, I have one of my colleagues said this was the scariest film in the festival, <laughs> uh, which I, I think is, you know, it is it is really quite alarming. Uh, I mean, what do you think? Um, do you want to I, I mean, I, I the main difference, I think, between this film and the previous film is is I, I think that sense of dread is sort of stronger in this one, and it, it also, it has a more act. Despite that, it also has a very sort of hopeful ending. I think a very optimistic ending. Uh, do you want to talk a bit sure. about how that came yeah. about? Because uh, probably in two thousand and thirteen, that wasn't the the case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in in terms of the 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 latter question, the sort of hopeful ending. Um, I think in in lockstep with the. Uh, and the sort of relationship between the two points, as things have gotten worse, as the problems have gotten more urgent, as this film needed to be, I think, more, more powerfully urgent. The first one kind of had a lot of play in it. It had a lot of humor. It was just looking at this institution, coming up with clever ways to, um, to, to kind of reveal what it really was. But this film 
is undoubtedly more urgent, more angry, um, and and more. We're really in a crisis. We're in an existential crisis, and I think that is the case. We are much more than we were in in 2013 or in 2003. I mean, uh, you look at any issue, you know, whether it's Trump, whether it's democracy and the rise of the right, whether it's inequality, racial injustice, climate change, species extinction, um, health, uh, the evisceration of social systems for protecting health and education and welfare. They're all at crisis levels. So we are in crisis. And I think we weren't in that kind of existential crisis when we made the first film. Uh, and so I, I hope, I mean, I hope and you feel that in the film. But also as the crises have become more acute, um, so too has the response through activism, through people saying enough is enough, the final words of the film, through uprisings. I mean, through, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders would have been impossible 20 years ago, an open socialist making a serious run to be president of the United States. Ada Kolau, I mean, all of these people we look at, um, all of the, the indigenous struggles and protests and the progress that they've made, the Black Lives Matter, uprising in the wake of uh, George Floyd's brutal police killing. All of these things, I think, are, are painful, but, but they're signs of hope. They're signs that, that people are, are waking up if they weren't awake before, um, and in large, large numbers, and, and working collectively. In terms of this being a scary film, the kind of model that I had in mind in, in building it um, was, uh, as a writer, um, was, was a zombie film. Um, because in a zombie film, you're starting out in a, a sort of bucolic, pleasant village, usually. Um, and the neighbors are all nice, you know, so corporations are socially responsible. Um, but then all of a sudden, it appears that there's something very different than you thought they were, and that they're in fact flesh eating monsters, and they're destroying the society and they're destroying the community. And, and people are killed. And, and the community is on the brink of absolute destruction. But then some of the survivors band together and, and they start to plan and organize to beat back the zombies and the hopefully happy ending of the film, or at least the hopeful ending of the film, is that they're either about to prevail or they do prevail. Um, so it has that kind of three-part zombie film um, uh, form, and, and I actually think that is, it, it reflects the reality of, of what we're looking at in the film. For me, one of the chilliest scenes, uh, the, the most chilling scenes is the, uh, or the, I guess eerie, is, is the whole, uh, the, the segment in, in Davos, where it's so self-congratulatory. And, you know, as, as, the, as the, I think it's a, da a Danish or a Swedish guy who says, no one's talking about taxes. That's the right. most important thing. Uh, right. people, rich people don't, uh, corporations and the wealthy do not pay their fair share. And, and I think that's, but it's also, it's just so weird that everyone's sort of yeah. congratulatory about the whole thing. Yeah, that's, um, that's Bregman, um, and he's actually Dutch, but oh, uh, close, close, same, same area. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Davos was, was truly bizarre. It was bizarre how we got there. We, we asked for media credentials, and actually we got one of the quickest responses to them that we got from anybody on the whole film, which was no. You can't come here. Um, <laughs> and it was because they only issue media credentials generally to broadcast media and not to documentary crews. Um, so I thought of another way to approach it. Um, we got in touch with Klaus Schwab, who you saw in the film, who's the head of the whole thing, and, um, and sought an interview with him and actually convinced him to sit down for an interview. And so we flew to New York to interview him, and we did that. And after the interview, you know, we'd had a really great exchange and a nice time. Um, I just said, you know, your, your people, like, just turned us down like that. We, we'd love to come to Davos and see you in action there and sort of see what's going on. So, um, so he said, sure. So we were off to Davos. And um, 
It is an absolutely surreal place. As a as a filmmaker, I really wanted to to visually and in a in a sort of story sense try to give a feel for this notion that there's a real consensus and movement in the corporate world towards this, we're going to be good now. And you can only show so many ads, which we do, you know, where corporations are presenting themselves as good actors. But to actually be able to feature Davos as the kind of magic mountain of this idea um, was really was really great, and and to you know see Jamie Dimon talking about Detroit, and and see Bebop Gresta trying to pitch uh, Dimon on you know to get money to build his Hyperloop, uh, and to see uh, Sandra Navidi sort of walking around there. Um, she has an odd sort of insider outsider status. She's written a book quite critical of some of these things, but she's accepted among them because she's a financial consultant on Wall Street. So it was just it was just absolutely fascinating. I think it really in the way you're talking about it gave that creep factor to to the idea of the new corporation. Because I think in a lot of ways despite the veneer and the and the wealth and the you know nice suits and stuff uh, it, it feels like there's a desperation there. It's like an Amway convention, like, you know, the, uh, and, and then like that nice, that great shot with the, uh, uh, just outside the door with all the butts piling up and the, <laughs> it felt like any, any convention you'd go to, it was no different. Yeah, no, absolutely. It is kind of like an Amway convention in, in, I mean, I think, I think this is the thing, and this is kind of the storyline that we were both implying and making explicit. Um, Coming out of the period in which we made the first film, uh, the anti-globalization protest, the film like ours, Michael Moore's work, you know, books like mine and many others that were critical of corporations, you really did see a wake-up call in the corporate world. You did see them saying, oops, um, people are in the streets. Uh, this is dangerous. Our legitimacy is being questioned. We become really, really powerful, and people are starting to notice it, and they're starting to say, wait a minute, you guys are more powerful than democratic governments now. So all of this was crashing around 2000, and the response of the corporate sector was, as you saw it, you saw political science Peter DeBurn saying at the outset, around 2005, they started to do all this stuff, and they did. They did start to do a lot of stuff, but nothing that would compromise their profitability. But they did a lot of things that, that were real. It wasn't only talk. You know, they, they did reduce their use of water. They did go to green energy. They recycled and all of, they did all these things. But I think they understand that it's still very fragile, that their power and their domination in the world is very fragile that it's, it's built on sand in some ways because it's not real. Be, for the reasons that we outline, corporations always have to put the interests of their shareholders above social and environmental interests. So they really are constrained in ways that their rhetoric suggests they're not. And they know that contradiction is there. And the people involved in corporations know it. And when you talk to them, there's, there's a certain palpable anxiety. I mean, that that it, it doesn't all feel right. Um, and, and there's, you know, when you go to Davos, there is all that stuff, but just below the surface, everybody's wheeling and dealing. You know, it's a place where, where people make deals. It's a, like a big financial conference with a veneer of we're going to save the world over it. And they know this. They know that it's a very thin veneer and they know that they're actually quite vulnerable. Yes, in the middle there.
financial gain in parkland Did everyone yeah. hear that? Everyone heard? Yes? At the back there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a summary of the question is, are you a hypocrite? And I'm, I'm going to uh, say no. Uh, I, I, it's a totally great question. It's actually in two parts, and let me deal with the latter first. Your first question is kind of what do we do, which is a really important question. Uh, the second point is, is how do you reconcile having Bell Media as your broadcaster, a publicly traded corporation, uh, being at a festival that's sponsored by RBC, et cetera. And I got into trouble when, when, when we took the corporation to Sundance, just a short anecdote. Um, the People's Choice ballot had the actual logo of Coca-Cola on it. And... Um, uh, was the the People's Choice Award, which we ended up winning for for Docs, was uh, sponsored by Coca Cola, and so when I got up to make the acceptance speech, I pointed that out, and I pointed out the fact that the whole festival was sponsored by a bevy of corporations that could have easily, some of them were, been in the film. And I really got in trouble for that. Um, the organizer wouldn't talk to me. Uh, I got slammed by uh, American me media, by a uh, film critic in Canada uh, for the National Post. So, um, so I feel like I'm on some shaky ground here, but let me, let me try to answer the question. Um, I guess when you think of Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, and he was operating in a system that was totally dominated by the Catholic Church. When you think of uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, taking British rail company trains to the protest marches he was going to lead. Uh, when you think of Martin Luther King uh, driving to the march on Washington uh, in a vehicle made by the Ford Motor Company, um, it's very hard not to be complicit in the system you're in if you want to do anything. And, and um, some of you are going, you know, you can come back at me and I'll debate this, but, you know, we had to use cameras that were made by Sony. We had to fly on Lufthansa Airlines to get to Europe and United and American, which we criticize in the film, uh, to get to our shoots, uh, not to mention that we were frequenting these corporations. We were also contributing to climate change that we were criticizing in the film. And... So I guess the short answer is that as a filmmaker, I, you know, my book is, is being published by um, Penguin Random House, which is still partly owned by Pearson, which is one of the investors in Bridge International Academies, which we criticize in the film. Um, and it's endless. You know, we're going to be in other film festivals sponsored by corporations. We're going to be, hopefully, distributed in some way or another. We may even end up on Amazon, for God's sake, you know, Amazon Prime, right, after what we, what we talked about with them, or Netflix, or so. The alternative to, to being complicit in those ways is, is not to do anything. And that that's that's a real choice and it's a choice that that I make with my eyes open and and very conscious of the contradictions that it entails but you know and I'm not saying I'm Gandhi or anything but if Gandhi didn't take the train to lead the protests uh against the British empire uh they wouldn't have happened so you know cuz he wouldn't have got there um if if I didn't if my if this film weren't in this film festival, we wouldn't get distribution. If we don't get distribution, nobody's going to see it. So, it's a it's an imperfect world, um, and and I know that maybe imperfection is just a convenient defense for hypocrisy. And as I say, I'm open to having this this debate. But in terms of my own conscience, when I wrestle with it, um, it's it's something about not allowing. Uh, not allowing the aspiration to be perfect to undermine attempts to be good. And, you know, I, so there, there isn't a logically, um, even perhaps ethically, entirely satisfactory answer to your question, which is an excellent one. 
from a kind of epistemological or no, ontological level. Sorry, I'm a law professor, it's my day job, so I, <laughs> I use weird words like that. But from a, from a perception about knowledge, what it says to us is just how deep we are in the system that we can't criticize it without using its tools. So it's the old using the tools of the master to take down the master's house kind of thing. And there are many problems with that. And I don't want to in any way suggest that I'm trying to easily avert what is a really important um, idea when you're doing this kind of work. There are those inevitable ironies, like the, the minute you put out any knowledge or an analysis. I mean, uh, when Naomi Klein wrote No Logo, like years later, business people were using it to figure out how to sell things. Yeah. So, I mean, that does happen. Uh, we can do one more. Go ahead. Question was yeah. Question was uh, is is there a way to step outside or that involvement with the corporation uh, or the current system, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I mean I, I think there is and I think that's what we're trying to to say at the end of the film. Um, when I look at history, there usually simple solutions are not are not good solutions. So, you know, to end the film saying we should get rid of corporations entirely, or we should just, you know, stop capitalism. Um, those are unrealistic and, and not viable. It's not going to happen that way. History happens in different ways. So my own personal sense of how we get out of the need to be complicit in that way and how we get out of the total domination that corporations currently wield is by re-energizing our democratic institutions, by reclaiming them. So the story about Atticola, where she says we want to take back what is ours, we want to take back the city government of Barcelona because that's ours. That's what the, the, the difference institutionally between a corporation and a democratic institution is that a corporation has a legal obligation to serve its shareholders above all other interests. A democratic institution has a legal constitutional obligation to serve the public interest and to serve the people. So for me, it's really about trying to re-energize those institutions, which means protesting in the streets. It means organizing. It means things like Occupy. But as we really try to emphasize at the end of the film, it means more than that, too. It also means trying to gain political power. And that's a new idea among activists, uh, progressive activists. And you're starting to see it uh, you know, through Bernie Sanders, through Colau, through people like that. You're starting to see this resurgence of a kind of progressive activist, large P politics that really kind of had been dormant since I would say the 1960s. So I think that's a really good course to be on. And I think the idea is that a democratic government can in fact control corporations. They create corporations. They can uncreate them. They can regulate them. They can say that corporations are not allowed to run water systems and schools. They can, they can do all of that. And hopefully, and again, history evolves in very strange ways, but hopefully eventually we move to a system that isn't corporate capitalist. I mean, when you think of what does capitalism mean, it means that the ism of our society is the accumulation of capital, that our entire social endeavor is to ensure that capital is accumulated. That's bizarre. What kind of a system is that? Um, socialism definitely has its problems, but just as a word, sometimes, in some ways, I mean, I'm a socialist, but everybody has a different conception of what that means, but, um, but at least the concept is that the ism is social. It's society. It's the people. That's the ism to serve, not the accumulation of capital. And, and so if we're going to move to anything that, that's viable uh, as, as a sustainable society, it's going to, it may have corporations, I don't know, and it may have market systems, I don't know. But its ultimate, its ultimate goal has to be 
to serve the collective inter in interests of society, the individuals within it, to provide what people need to, to live decent lives and to flourish, and all of those good things. That, that should be the end, not the accumulation of capital and the hope and dream that somehow something will trickle down enough to serve all of those social and environmental goods. I guess that trickle-down notion is ultimately what we're trying to criticize here. Okay, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up, but I think that's a great note to end it on. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming. It means a lot, and thanks so much for the film. Thank it you. is screening digitally tonight, so please tell your friends. I think it's 6 p.m., and uh, keep your eyes open. Oh, do we? Is there a release date or uh, a release date for? Uh, no, we we don't we don't know what's happening with it. I can tell you that my book, though, not to plug it or anything, is out September twenty second, and it's the same name, but the subtitle is different. It is how good corp how good corporations are bad for democracy. That's the subtitle of the book. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks again.